Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Philip Preston, and I would like to welcome you to our third online marketing club event, Developing Customer Insight to Drive Marketing Strategy. The Marketing Club was created primarily to help students get the most from their Graduate Gateway accredited degree and prepare them for a career in marketing. This club event is one of four online events we've run this academic year, with the final one on the 21st of April. Of course, CIM members and other marketing practitioners are welcome to attend as well as students. As you can appreciate right now, the club exists online only, but when things return to normal, we hope to provide networking opportunities for students and marketing practitioners. The uninitiated, the CIM Graduate Gateway Programme enables students to gain a professional marketing qualification by taking advantage of the exemptions Graduate Gateway provides. If you are a student, you can sign up now to receive the Graduate Gateway newsletter. Simply use the QR code you can see on this slide. We'll also send you a link to the sign up page after today's event. Each edition will provide you with content designed to support your studies and actively manage your professional development by keeping you up to date with the latest trends, innovations and concepts in the marketing industry. OK, before we get started, I'd just like to go over a few things so you know how the event will work and how to participate. The presentation will last for approximately 35 to 40 minutes, followed by a 10 to 15 minute Q&A session. You'll be able to post any questions you have by typing into the questions box on your control panel, which you'll see on the right hand side of your screen if watching on a laptop or along the top or bottom if you're watching on a tablet or smartphone. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll attempt to answer as many as we can during the Q&A at the end. If you want to share your thoughts on social media, we're using the hashtag CIM events. The webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on the CIM YouTube channel within three to four working days. And you'll also be emailed a short feedback survey after the webinar, which we'd love you to complete. It'll only take a few minutes and all survey responses are anonymous, so please do let us know your thoughts. Okay, I'd now like to hand over to Abigail Dixon, who is our guest speaker today. Thank you so much, Phil. So just before I start today's presentation, I just thought I'd take a few moments to introduce myself. So I'm a Chartered Marketeer and Fellow. I'm an accredited course director for the CIM and also an ICF accredited coach. And I'm an award-winning client-side marketeer and consultant. Um, I've been working with many household brands, helping them step change their growth for over 20 years. I'm founder and director of Labyrinth Marketing, whose passion and mission is to step change the growth of brands, agency, and the people behind the brands. And I'm also the podcast host and author of The Whole Marketeer. The famous brand slide, just a quick uh, snapshot of some of the brands and industries that I have helped grow over my 20 year career. So let's get into the crux of today's webinar. What is Insight? Today, I'm going to start off before we go into customer insight and then how we apply that into strategy by actually talking about what truly is insight. And what insight is not is data. Data is important. It's the root foundation of any insight and without it, we can't mine, but it is not insight. So just want to take a moment to just stress test and pull apart what those two, three, two things mean. So data will tell you what is happening. It will tell you a fact or an inference or a movement that is happening but it won't tell you what is insight. Insight only comes from the act of mining the data and extracting that information, a bit like the orange juice from an orange, from a variety of different source, data sources. And that's what I wanna focus on today, is I'm not going to talk to you about all the different data sources out there, qualitative or quantitative, primary or secondary, internal or external, but I am gonna focus my energies on talking through the process it takes to move from data to insight. It's not what is happening, it's why it's happening, that root cause. And I'm going to talk about that a lot more today, this evening, depending on where you are in this world. And it's about thinking about not why someone is act, not what the behavior or what someone is doing, but why are they doing that as a human? What is the emotion that is fueling them, the decision making process to really try and get under the skill, under the skin and the psychological drivers that are driving that consumer or customer to make the choices that we that they are making so we can understand and allow them to satisfy that through our products and services that we develop. So the definition of insight is the capacity to have an accurate and deep understanding of something or someone. And today we're going to be focusing on that someone. 
And that someone is a customer, so someone who is buying our products, if that's business to business, or a consumer, the person that is also the purchasee, but also the person using the product. So I will use those two terminologies interchangeably tonight, even though they do mean two separate things. So customer insight allows you to help you to understand how your customers behave, but more importantly, why they behave that way. So why is that so important? So if I think about what the definition of marketing is, it's the management process responsible for identifying, anticipating, and satisfying customers' requirements profitably. So without insight, we wouldn't be able to identify, we wouldn't be able to anticipate, nor would we accurately be able to satisfy those customer gain or pain points. So to those listening tonight, the challenge I want to put to you is how well do you know your customers and consumers? Who are they? Beyond what I always call the obvious, the, their age, their demographics, or the geodemographics, or where they live. And I see too often many briefs come in or many strategies written just simply stating age, sex, and location, and maybe some information about what they do for a living. But that's not, that's who they are. That's not why they're doing what they do. So what do they do? How do they spend their day? What do they do for a living? What do they do outside of work? How's their day made up? But I'm not only what do they do, why do they do those things? What are their beliefs, their passions, their aspirations, the emotional drivers within them that are driving them to make choices? When they're looking to choose your product or service, what is their decision making criteria? What's important to them? What are their preferences? How do they spend their week, their working week, their weekend? What are their values, their motivations, their attitudes, their beliefs? Are they happy with their existing product or service? What would they like to see? What are those pain points that you could help solve and satisfy? And what are those gain points that you would help elevate them? To, especially as we know, consumers and customers at the moment are really looking for brands that allow them to live the life that they want, their future life, their aspirational life that they want to live. So how can you satisfy that? So thinking about this presentation, I wanted to highlight to you something that I often see in many strategy decks, in many uh, agency briefs, is the persona. And the persona is a great way of visually building together the representation of a customer or consumer. So in this case, one that I pulled from online today, which was found at disruptiveadvertising.com, was for a coffee brand where they looked at one of their key target customers and started to pull that insight and that richness together that they could then form their communications and other strategies around. So in this case, they're talking about Stacey the student and they talk about her daily life. But as you can see, they talk about more than just who she is, where she lives and what she does. They also talk about her pain points. So in this case, being able to pay her bills or get stuck somewhere and not having enough time with her cat or not being able to pay back her school debt. So we're going you know, into the deep things that are bothering her on a day to day basis, as well as her needs, what she's looking for, how she spends her day, because all of this is important, not only when we're setting our long term commercial strategy, so selecting which customers that we are going to go after, but also how best to communicate with them. And we can only do that if we truly understand what their pain and gain points are, but also where they are and how, which methods and me mechanics we're going to communicate on. I just wanted to bring um, some attention to Amazon and Prime Now as a really good example of not only identifying, but also anticipating. So it's no surprise to anyone, I'm sure, that Amazon is rich in data. It's also rich in insight because they take the time to not only understand what is happening, so that purchasing behaviour, but why it's happening. And where they're really strong is in the predicting, so the anticipation. Anticipation about what is going to happen next. And this is where the prime now concept has worked so well. So if most people are aware of Amazon Prime, a subscription service that you can sign up to on an annual basis that not only provides you with next day delivery, but also provides you with an entertainment platform as well where you can stream live videos. And most of those deliveries are made within 24 hours. And most of the time those deliveries are made within 24 hours because the Amazon is watching what you have bought, mapping it with what you might buy next 
and has already made the action and the bravery to move that produce closer to you in proximity. I often liken this to Lego sets. I have a son at one point in time was very interested in Lego. If he was buying set 532, they knew that it was likely that I was going to buy 533 and 34 to follow those. They probably had already made the anticipation of that that would be purchased and therefore moved that stock to a fulfillment centre near me. That is how, with that level of bravery and action anticipation, they are able to serve through Prime. Prime now goes that one step further and actually allows your produce to be delivered within a two hour window. Once again, from the things that are most frequently purchased in your geographic location for consumers that need that pain point of needing something quickly because they are cash rich and time poor. So a really good example of not only taking data, collecting that data, which they do do through many sources, anticipating, predicting and taking that action and bravery to actually move it into a proposition that solves more pain points or more gain points than their competitors. So if that's what insight is, how do we get insight? So if we're taking those data sources, whether that's primary or secondary, internal or external, quantitative or qualitative, how do we get to insight? Now, one of my favourite methods to do this is the five whys method, where we move from inference, an observation that we've made, maybe there is growth in a certain market, maybe there is some share differences that we've noticed, maybe we're noticing that certain consumers are buying certain things, or there's a trend or a habit, an inference. And it's really important that you start with an inference. You're already identifying a behaviour that has happened that you want to be inquisitive and find out more about. So if that inference is the what, the five whys allows you to ask the why question and hypothesize, which you can validate later, as to what that root cause is by asking five whys. Now, funnily enough, I often get asked the question, if I get there in three whys, is that fine? If it takes me seven whys, is that fine? It doesn't have to be fine, but my only build would be, if it's only three, have you gone deep enough? Now, marketing is a science. It's what I love about it. However, this is the one place where I will say, you know when you've hit the insight, when you feel something inside, because it's a motive. You know with customer insight or consumer insight, when you've hit the insight because you're getting to a raw consumer truth, something that is telling about human behaviour. So you take the inference, you ask yourself why, 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 using hypotheses, using various data sources as you go until you get to the crux of what you believe is that consumer insight. Then to make insight usable, you need to think then about the so what. So what does this mean? Why is this a benefit? What could we do with this? And have some clarity before presenting into your business the now what because otherwise that insight isn't actionable and then it can't be used internally in your strategy, in the wider business. So let me take you through an example. I'm sure there's many of you on here that are cat lovers or cat owners. And if I just use uh, an example, if we were working on a cat food brand just to bring this to life. So an inference would be something that we have noticed. So in this case, we've identified value growth in cat food. Now we've got inference. Now we can ask the first why. Well, why is that value growth? So by mining the information or getting a data source, where is that value growth come from? Well, we've noticed that the value gro the growth in the cat food market, which is value, is because premium brands of cat food are in growth. That's what's driving the value. OK, so it's premium brands. Why? Why are cat owners willing to pay more for premium brands of cat food? In this case, because cat, they feel that cats are part of the family. Well, why is that important that they treat their cats and give them the best with premium cat food? Because they feel bad for leaving the cats at home all day. OK, so now we're getting to the emotion behind it. What they're doing is they're buying premium cat food. But why they're doing it is to negate the guilty feeling of neglecting or feeling like they've left their cats at home all day while they've been out busy out working. The cat owners want to treat their cats because they are part of the family and it helps them alleviate the guilt. But now what? Because if that's the insight, what are we going to do with it? Well, I'll talk about I'll talk about later on in today's presentation around actually putting that into the strategy. 
but really what we want is actual insight. So going back to the business with what you've uncovered and actually giving some clear recommendations on now what. So if I was that cat food brand owner and whether I was a premium player or not, you know, I could use this human truth to either A, fuel maybe some communication. So showing how my premium brand of cat food um, allows my cats to feel loved after having left them all day, or maybe even, you know, creating that scene so people really feel that I understand as a brand what it feels like to be a cat owner and, you know, alleviate that guilt for that cat to be rewarded and to very much be seen as part of the family. So, you know, that could fuel very much some of the comms. It also might feel potentially expanding my product range. Maybe I want to put more premium cat food as it's in growth into market, but ones that talk maybe about treating or indulging or rewarding the cats because they that is the pain point that this premium cat food is going to address. So the what, the so what, and the now what. And the reason I want to spend some time on this is because I see many data sources across many different organizations from those that have hardly any to those that have ample and what i often find is that the more they have the less likely they are to have mined it actually mined all those data sources to get the richness and actually identify the insight when they have identified the insight very often they will go aha great and it gets dropped into a powerpoint presentation but the so what why is that of interest is often forgotten and if it's not forgotten and the so what and the now what is identified not many organizations are acting with pace acting quickly and with bravery to bring those products or services or comms or new strategy to market based on that new insight that they have uncovered and so for me insight needs to come with acting with pace bravery and a business that is willing to work quickly to leverage that insight and that, for me, is what drives competitive advantage with insight. Yes, having a, a different data sources or a richness of data versus your competition, but actually competitive advantage comes from actioning it quickly. So having spent the time reviewing your data sources, observing inferences, using the five whys model to identify and mine your hypotheses, which you may then need to go and validate uh, further with some additional in um, research and you start to think about the what the so what and the now what i just wanted to share with you a really great tool that is a a good way comes from the leading edge around how to present that insight back into the business so a good insight has a structure an insight is a significant human truth about that target audience that you can leverage to grow so the target who and as i said earlier when i was showing you the personas we want to go deeper than just the age, the profile, the demographics. We also want to be talking about uh, their pain points, their drivers, how they're spending their day, what their what emotional uh, pain points and gain points are, how they're spending their week, what their values and attitudes and beliefs are. We want to get to that level of emotional richness. So the who. Then what's that significant truth? Why are they doing or not doing something? Leverage, which is not dissimilar to the so what, so what are our capabilities to respond? What could we do? And the bit that makes a difference is the last, which is growth. So how can I get the business to gain traction behind me to want to action this insight with bravery and a can-do attitude and allow it to be leveraged quickly? So what do we prioritize and when do we do it? And what is that sometimes worth to the business if we were to leverage that and leverage that quickly so that you're getting the sense of importance and traction and buy-in from others within the organization. So if that's insight, that's how you build customer insight by taking a variety of different data sources, ensuring that you have enough understanding of your customers on that deep rooted emotional level, that you understand what they're doing throughout their day, what pain and gain points you can satisfy, then we need to think about how this can be embedded into our strategies. So in order to embed them into our strategies, I wanted to take you through a strategic planning process. Um, and one of my favourites is from PR Smith, which is the SOSTAC planning system. And the reason I love the SOSTAC planning system so much is that it looks from the outside in. It starts off by looking outside the organisation 
and then moving in so that we can make the decisions before setting the strategic agenda. So let me just walk you through this process. The first stage is situational analysis. That's a mouthful. Where are we now? So where are we now as an organisation? What is our current position? But when people say that they think, oh, what is happening right now? But actually, when you're writing your situation analysis, you need to be able to look at what is happening for the duration of the plan that I'm actually building. So in this instance, if you're writing a three to five year strategy, I want you to be able to predict at what's happening both now in the organisation with your current situation and your position, but also what might affect you in the organisation over the next five years. So insight is fundamental to understanding not only your current position, but also what trends might be affecting your business. So trends being things that are happening in our macro environment, so political, economical, social, technological, legal and environment. It also is asking you to look at your micro. So what is happening within the market in which I operate in? How competitive is it? What are the suppliers doing? What are the stakeholders wanting? How are employees involved? In order to get a viewpoint, we need to also have data sources that allow those questions to be answered. How well are we doing versus our competitors? But also what competitive intelligence do we have that's going to allow us to think about what not only what our competitors are doing now, what they might do next and what are we going to do as a result. We also can use that insight to get an internal viewpoint of what our employees think about our organisation, where it is and where it could go. So we're getting a rounded view. The next is objectives. So where do we want to be? So the vision, the mission, the corporate objectives, the purpose that we are setting, that forward stance. And once again, without insight, we would not be able to set an accurate vision or mission or even one that is motivating to our customers, to our consumers, if we didn't have clarity or understanding of what our customers and consumers want, but also the space in the marketplace that we could own. The next and the most important is strategy. So how are we going to get there? If you have set out your vision, what are the choices that we can and should make strategically to ensure that we get there. And those choices around which geographic markets, which segments of those markets, who are we targeting, having identified that customer insight or that consumer insight and how we're positioning ourselves. And I personally truly believe that positioning should be built once we have got clarity on who that target audience is because we want to build a brand that is reflective of what they need and want us to be for them. So having defined that strategy and having set your SMART objectives, then we can look and only then into the tactics. Once again, if we don't have the understanding about how our consumers or customers are spending the day, it's going to be very difficult to map those tactics, whether that's the products and services that you develop, the pricing that we should be setting, choosing the right distribution channels, or even looking at how we communicate if we don't know how we spend their day. If we don't spend their day, we don't know how we're going to get to them, how we're going to communicate, where we need to sell our product so that they can be accessible, especially in this digital world in which we live in. So which channels are they truly using? And not only what channels, what are we going to say that's motivating? And that, once again, is intrinsically needs to be based on insight so that we are communicating on that motive level, that we're building communications that allows us to connect deeply with our consumers and resonate to the point they go, yes, they get me. That's my brand of choice. That's my product of choice. We then need to put that plan into action. In order to put it into action, we need to make sure that we are continuously monitoring ourselves and making sure that we are delivering against that. So KPIs and trackers, once again, they need data to make sure that we are measuring against where we said we were going to be, as well as setting KPIs and calculating ROI, neither of which can be done without the understanding of what those activities would be worth or whether those key performance indicators are realistic when they're initially set and whether they've been achieved when we monitor and evaluate them afterwards. So in summary, insight is fundamental to the whole strategic planning process. It's fundamental in the beginning when we're talking about auditing our markets, where we are now, where we're going, but also within our actually the competitive nature of our markets. It's important when we're trying to set a vision and a mission and a purpose that is motivating, but also realistic. 
it's important when we're making the choices versus our competition on where we're going to play, who we're targeting. And it doesn't have to be just one target audience, it could be multiple, and how the brand is positioning ourselves to ensure that we appeal to those target audiences. It's also looking at the tactics, as I said, the product, the place, the price, the promotion, the people, the process, the physical evidence, all of which need data to inform where we're setting and which ones we're choosing, the implementation of the plan, and then also monitoring that through ROIs and KPIs. So in summary, if we're going to put insight into our plans, there are many tools that we would, that we would use in order to make sure that we are have insight being put into practice. So the PESTEL, our SWOT analysis, our competitive scenario planning, so what our consumer customers, sorry, what our competitors are doing now, doing next, and may do in the future, and also how may they respond to the activities that we're planning to do. The mission, is it realistic? Is it motivating, not only internally, but externally? And the same for the vision. Objectives, we want to be setting smart objectives that are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timed but we can't determine whether they're realistic if we don't have an understanding on the marketplace or what we are likely to achieve in any specific time period. The selection of the activation, so how are we gonna bring this to market? And this, once again, is another key area in which customer insight is intrinsic. And then also the tactical strategy. So how are we going to deploy this? How is this going to be motivating? How are we gonna bring this to market? Which ways are we going to do this that is disruptive based on, on how we know our customers or consumers spend their day and how we're going to make sure we communicate those pain and gain points on an emotional level to really get into the, the heart and into the decision making. And last but not least, performance. So what are those KP, KPIs, key performance indicators? What are we going to generate in return for what we are doing? And without that market data and information, we aren't able to set that to be a realistic target. So having looked at the true definition of insight, insight being what happens when you mine your data to get to a true aha moment, a true consumer emotional truth, and then taking that insight and making sure that it's actionable, thinking about the what, the so what, and the now what, so that you have actionable insight and that you are quantifying that to get traction internally. And then taking that insight and applying it to, it to your strategic planning process and then ensuring that insight sits at the top middle and bottom as i would like to say of that strategic planning process it's not an easy task so what i wanted to do now was allow you some time to reflect by asking you a few questions what data sources are you aware of and if you're working within an organization which does your organization possess have these data sources been mined using the five W's or another form of methodology to uncover true consumer or customer insight? How well do I know my consumers or customers? Do I have a deep rooted understanding of what they do, but more importantly, why they do it, how they spend their day and why, their motivations and beliefs, their values and their aspirations? Have I developed an insight statement that is actionable, that can be used by the wider organisation? And having built those insight statements, how can I ensure that these are used as the basis for any strategic work or any tactical work done within the business? And the reason I ask you these questions are because when I'm auditing businesses or helping them build strategic plans, some of the issues within an organisation will sit amongst some of these questions. So the first being, what data sources do I possess? Sometimes some businesses have so many that most marketers aren't aware of all of those that they're currently being collected. So a good exercise to do is to actually map your customer journey and say, what data sources do I have at each step of this journey that would allow me to understand? And if I have gaps, how do I solve those? Sometimes we don't always need new, site, new insight or new data. We just need to simply mine the existing data that we already have. Have these been mined, many organisations continuously track certain data sources without taking periodic times or moments in time to actually mine this to find out the what and the so what and the now what. 
and they become more continuous tracking than they do necessarily fresh insight. And also with your data sources, do you have a good mix of qualitative and quantitative, the thoughts and feelings, but also the robustness? Do you have primary and secondary data or research studies that you've commissioned yourself versus those that are already available in the marketplace that your competitors can also get hold of? And are you also looking at internal data sources and what you can gather about your customers and consumers as well as external? And ideally, you'd have a mix of all of those data types to get the richness that you need. Qualitative, you're getting more of the words and not enough of the robustness. Too much quantitative, you're getting the proof, but not necessarily the level of understanding and emotional intelligence that you need. Secondary sources only means that you haven't got any unique sources versus your competitors, whereas primary allows you to have richness potentially that your competitors don't have. And how well do you know your customers and consumers? If you were having to develop a campaign, a strategy, a brief, are you able to tell that third party or in your wider organisation something more than their age, their job title, what they do for a living and where they live? Could you tell them what their values are, their beliefs are, their motivations, their pain points, their gain points, so that you have that richness so that you can really tap into on that deep emotional level? And have you built insight statements so that that insight can actually be shared? I see too often insight being mined either in a research and insight department or by the marketeer alone or as a team and it not being cascaded and shared in that wider business where potentially a customer service provider or the sales force or anybody else that is is client facing in any any way could actually benefit from having that understanding of your insight of your customers and your consumers and how do we make sure that they are center top middle and bottom of everything we do when we are building a strategic plan so often people say well Abby when you're looking at marketers and you're looking at those that are strong insight, what would you recommend? What would you suggest they do to build these skills? So the first is look beyond age demographics and geography. If somebody gives you a brief or tells you about something internally or a campaign that has happened, really start to question, do, is there more richness than this? Question the people that have given it to you, is there more? If there's not more, go and find it. There is always a secondary data source or a paper or social listening that you can do to get that richness. So now we know not only who they are, but why they're doing what they're doing. The next is to be curious. Spend time people watching. In my early career, this was something that I would always do. Get as close as I can to my consumers and be a bystander. Look at what they're doing. Look at how they're making decisions. Look how they're interacting with that product or service. Go for a ride with the sales force to see those customer interactions. But try and be a bystander to actually see that natural behaviour so you can get as close to what is happening as possible. And try to start making your hypothesis about why that is happening and what they are doing. And not just with your consumers and customers. Are you somebody that people watches? Something very easy to do, which is to grab a cup of coffee, sit on a park bench and just observe the people around you, why they are doing what they're doing. Trying to draw hypothesis, trying to ask those five wise questions in your head to see if you could hypothesize the reason why that behavior is happening. Another fun game that I often play is guess the insight on adverts. So I play a game where I watch the advert and guess what the insight behind it could or should have been and always ask why whether you're asking the consumer or customer yourself or you're asking that why keep going until you get to that emotional richness so that's the end of the formal presentation um, i do want to say please do keep in touch uh, whether that's on linkedin via labyrinth my consultancy whether you want to listen to the podcast the whole marketeer podcast or follow uh, me on Instagram at The Whole Marketeer and to also ask you to keep an eye out for the book that's coming out in May and the new activity that'll be happening for The Whole Marketeer. That's great, many thanks uh, Abby. Before we go into the questions I'd just like to point out if you haven't already noticed that there's a um, handouts tab on, in the control panel and in that 
tab, you'll find a PDF of Abby's uh, slide deck from today, together with some additional reading. Okay, so we're now going to have a short 10 to 15 minute Q&A session. Um, as a reminder, you can still submit your questions via the questions box in your control panel. Okay, Abby, first question for you then. Um, besides pain and gain points, do you think customer personas really work in B2B? Or would a customer archetypes model approach, teach me, guide me, serve me, enlighten me, is that a more appropriate approach? There are many methods when it comes to business to business, but I would say decision making criteria is probably the one that I would, would fall to, um, where we're looking at the gatekeeper, the information search, the decision making holder, the purchase holder, and so on. Um, and what I often say is that don't forget they're human too. So some of the things I've talked about with consumers in this case still apply, because if you can get the understanding about why they're doing what they're doing, maybe a nervousness around purchasing, you know, how they're spending their day, what they're going to get out of making this purchase with you, things that they may be nervous around, all of those things still apply. They're still human. So yes a different structure of methodology of thinking of mapping out that journey helps yes but so does not forgetting that they are human too and thinking about their attitudes and beliefs especially with the overlap with organization as well great um okay second question uh, how scientific does the data and insight need to be is some of it assumptions or common sense does it need to be quantified each time Yes, it does need to be validated. So if you're making a hypothesis on say the second or third why, either, um, I would say the best way to do this is almost like as a, as a hot house, so that you have multiple data sources. So that as you start to hypothesize as to why that is happening, you can go and find that data source as quickly as possible to say whether that is true or not. Also, it's not always a linear line. So it could be that you have multiple hypotheses as to why. So if we just think about that cat food brand, there could have been many reasons that premium brands of cat food were in growth. Yes, it could be that um, it could have been that there is, uh, I don't know, shortage in supply um, of premium cat food. Maybe they've been overly promoted. There could be multiple reasons and you might want to explore all of those as their own funnel of, of um, asking the why. And they do need to be validated because unless once you get to the bottom, that hypothesis isn't validated, it's not insight. It needs to be robust. OK. Um, how do you organise your data into meaningful information to make decisions? So I. I think the first thing that I would always do is map that customer consumer journey because that will give you the blind sides as to what you do and don't know. So if you're thinking about, if we're using a consumer one, awareness, interest, desire, and action, or if we're thinking about business to business, um, information search, need, purchase, and so on, what do you know at each of those points so you get understanding of that journey? And I think, so that's my first one. The second one is, do you have enough to make strategic decisions? So do you never know enough about the segments of the market or at least how they're being used so you can cluster and do you know enough about the target audience and i would say they're the two things that i would focus on if i needed to know how much insight do i actually need on to have and where would i prioritize okay um this one comes from the heart i think uh how do you convince people who have worked the same way for 30 plus years to change and look at things differently commercial benefit it's always commercial benefit. So um, there is a method called the square method, spelled S-C-Q-U-A-R-E, I do believe. And it talks about a pivotal question. And in that pivotal question, you are basically stating to the business what they will get or what they will lose. So you're heightening the importance of what you're presenting if they do something or they do nothing. And if you link that with commercial benefit or loss, that's usually how you gain traction internally. So it moves the insight from being a nice to have to something that's a need to have and actually an opportunity for the business. Okay. Um, do you have any advice on how to start finding secondary data? Where do you start when there are so many different options? Okay. So, um, 
they there is Mintel and I do believe as students you have access to that for uh, I think a year within your studies as well so I would always start there and the reason I start there even if you don't buy the full report is it will tell you in the first few pages the size of the market how much it's worth and who the key players are and with those key players then you can go off and do your own secondary research whether that be online or um, doing competitive shops yourself to allow you to get in, under the skin of each of those customers. So that's why I always would start. Um, there are many studies also on the CIM database and industries, um, academic journals. I always start online though. So there is a lot of riches to be found. Okay, great. Um, sort of a related question really. Uh, what kind of tools are used currently to mine the data? Human, human behavior, there is some artificial intelligence looking at behaviors and patterns. I don't understand enough about that to be able to comment, but I haven't seen others than the five W's or the question why or things being kind of trying to get to the root cause um, is usually in a workshop environment, the most, most productive methodology I've seen. Okay, great. There's a couple of questions here around um, how do you gain evidence if you don't already have customers so you know if you're setting up a new business what would you recommend there so that would be around your target customers so if you haven't got them yet who do you want to get and also um so do exploratory research and that doesn't have to be expensive you know we live in a world where survey monkeys and asking who you believe to be your target customer certain questions is, is easy and quick to do and inexpensive. And I just like to say that for a second, because if I think back to the start of my career, when we used to commission what's an omnibus, which is a series of questions that allows you to get a quantitative read across the geographic representation, it used to take two weeks in field and a week for someone to analyze that. And I can get those feedback on that same level of data now within 24 to 48 hours. Um, so the speed and the cost is not as significant as it used to be. Um, also by researching your competitors, because you know everybody has a certain level of pound, dollar, euro. So where are you gonna steal that pound back from? And it might not be a direct competitor, it might be an indirect competitor, and start to understand how they're communicating and build the riches around your customer there. Okay, great. Um, here's one which is really topical, actually, a um, fascinating question. Um, I work for the NHS and working on the COVID vaccine at the moment, and it's been difficult to drill down to why some people are hesitant. We've gathered intelligence in various ways and had to move very fast. If you were doing this and we were starting from the beginning, what methods would you have followed? That's a really good one. <laughs> oh, that's a question for tonight. So what I would have done, hmm, I would have had a co-creation form of communication. So when it was launching out, I would have been building the communication with a, a mixed representation of the population. Um, so it's from, from us for you, because that way you're, in this case where you have to move so quickly and it's not something that's been done before, you would have to make a lot of assumptions about what their concerns would be before they're being asked them. Whereas if actually you were co-creating with them, what are your concerns when you're building this? What would you say? What would be useful? Then you're more likely to be able to have communication that allows you to, to um, address any concerns they may initially have before it gets scaled out. That's the first thing I would have done. The second thing is, um, is about understanding the true barriers as to why they don't want to take it and because it's such a sensitive issue i don't think this would have been done in a um you'd have to be independent so either an omnibus where they can have open-ended questions where they can say how they truly feel without feeling that someone is watching or judging or an in-depth interview where there is no uh, bias from somebody maybe in a focus group because if somebody is truly nervous, there is that potential fear of not speaking the truth. And especially when it's medicine, we know that from many studies, especially in, in ASH, anyone wearing a 
you know, white doctor's room is that they feel inferior and they often go with the most intelligent person that they believe is intelligent in the room as opposed to speaking their truth. So I think we'd have to be really clear and, and um, sensitive to the way in which the methodology would be conducted so you get the true concerns as to why and the true space to allow them to explore why because they might not know why themselves um, and that nervousness around not taking the vaccine. Okay, fascinating. Um, I just uh, change of tack now. So you talked about competition scenario planning. Mm. Are there any good frameworks or models to use for this? I don't think there is a classic framework that you can look at. Oh, yes, there is. Um, Davidson's competitive drill. I think that is what is called off my head. Um, I think it's called the seven step drill. I'm not completely sure, but if you put in Davidson a competitive drill, I'm pretty sure there would be something in there. Um, Hugh Davidson's written many books around offensive strategies, mainly on comms, but has, I'm pretty sure, ones on competitive drills as well, which follows a similar principle around what are they doing now? Where are they investing? What are they likely to do next? What would we do as a result? Okay, thank you. Um... How do you highlight the value for all of this insight when there is no monetary value for the company? There's no monetary value for the company yet, is what I would say. So if they're saying there's no monetary value for insight, I think it's clear that the, the so what and the now what has not been moved forward because that's what moves it from being a nice to have to a need to have. So if you have identified something that's a true human truth, when you're identifying the now what, looking at what that could then be worth, that's when the monetary value would come in. That's when business cases and models can be um, modelled through. And that's also when that can further testing can happen to understand consumers' propensity to purchase as well. That's when the money starts to happen. Great. Um, there's a very specific one from a student uh, who's doing a dissertation currently. So uh, quite a specific question. Question. I'm currently working on some pen portraits for my dissertation. I'm using a few sources, including Acorn's consumer classification. Can I use information from Acorn's different consumer classes and create one pen portrait from them? Or these groups are set and there is no fluidity between them. So can you change mix and max match? So mo Mosaic and Acorn is a kind of two different classifications. So yes, you can use, um, when you're doing a pen portrait, use those by all means. For me though, however, that's the who. So they are statements of national representation, I think from geodemographics, if I recall correctly. Um, and you can use those statements that are put in there. You can also use statements from things like TGI that are used for media when they are pulling together pen portraits. They are all statements. I would say having a good mix of the who, the where, and the why is what makes a really good pen portrait. Um, also one that can be really clear and succinct on the pain and gain points. So what a problem could I solve? And so the satisfy and what could I gain as well? What could they can gain from what we are offering? Okay, great. Um, how can you test that you have uncovered a real insight? So there's twofold here. One is you often feel it because you've hit that emotional piece. So like in that cat food example that I gave, you know that you've hit the emotional truth when we're talking about human behavior. So in this case, someone feeling guilty that they are leaving their cats, you must get that emotional richness. And then the second is you can take those statements and then sense check them. So you could have, um, which of the following do apply on a quantitative scale, I buy premium cat food because, and you could have those listed statements, that would then give you that kind of robust validation of your hypotheses. Okay, great. Um, I think I know the answer to this one. Uh, is it required to make a customer persona um, in, a, in a digital marketing plan? Yes, 100%. Yep. And the only thing that would make it digital bias would be on the digital platforms that they would use in their day. Um, and uh, content that they find motivating and also content that would also be in their periphery as well. Everything else still applies. What sort of models can be used to justify strategy details picked through marketing mix, the seven Ps? 
Justification is one thing that is asked by senior managers to provide the go-ahead for action plans. As to what product they're serving, which promotions, all of those can be tested by all different methodologies. So there is for product or concept testing, there is something that is national uh, representative, which is done by System One Thinking. Um, they used to be called Brain Juicer, now called System One, which will give you a national read on their propensity to purchase something that would validate. Um, you could also do price elasticity models to understand um, what someone would buy for a certain product. You could also look at what types of range called turf analysis or flavours or ranging that you would, would pull together. And you can also um, concept test your communications as well via link testing. So there is many different methodologies to validate everything that we do within promotions before we spend significantly. How do you know if my organisation has enough customer insight? If you can map the whole journey and have enough robust data sources under each stage so that you know what you need to do when, then you're good. If not, you need to plug those gaps. Okay, and um, I think it's time for one more question. So uh, what kinds of data do I need to mine insight from? You need a mix of both quantitative and qualitative um, primary and secondary so that you can find the answer to the question as each of you moved as you move through each of the whys okay um i think that's i think we've run out of time for questions now so thank you very much uh, abby for that that's, that was fascinating um so some great questions and some great answers um so that's all we have time for for our q a session today I'd like to say thank you to Abigail Dixon for today's presentation and a thank you to you for watching. Um, we do hope you found it interesting and worthwhile. Our next online marketing club event takes place at 6.30 on Wednesday, the 21st of April, when award-winning speaker Shula Kay will be talking about expressing your personal brand at work. You'll find further details listed on the CIM events page, where you can also book for the webinar. Once again, you'll shortly be receiving a survey on today's webinar and we'd really appreciate it if you could provide your feedback. So on behalf of Sam, thank you very much again for joining us and we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you again, Abby. Pleasure.